You got richer during the pandemic. Early retirement is still risky, though. Red hot stocks and real estate convinced many people to start their golden years sooner. People forget that markets go down. Do people actually forget that markets go down? No. Did, is that true? Do people forget that? Who, who forgets the markets go down? All right, so this is from Wall Street Journal. One of y'all has sent this to me. It's a, it's a good, it's worth a chuckle, that's for sure. And Ann Turgesson has uh, written it dateline just a couple days ago. Uh, if you own stocks or real estate, you're probably richer than you were when the pandemic began. That could put early retirement within reach. They say early retirement. Taking such a step is still risky, though. We got Greg Gressel. He decided to retire after being laid off from his job at Hershey in 2020. The 56-year-old now lives in Durango, Colorado. He said he felt comfortable retiring because uh, doing uh, retiring because such a bull market and a rise in his home's value pushed his net worth above his retirement goal. All right, so he got laid off, but now he felt comfortable retiring. Well, he was laid off, so he didn't <laughs> retire on his own. I feel guilt, say I feel guilty, but financially, COVID is the best thing that never happened to me. Uh, moving up a retirement date can be a gamble. Ooh. People who leave jobs early forfeit the chance to save additional sums of money and must make their holdings last longer. Some underestimate expenses, including health insurance, before Medicare begins at 65. If a correction occurs in early retirement, losses can be magnified and it can be harder to recover. Yeah. All right, so let's. Uh, I want to jump down here a little bit because I think this is pretty interesting. That U.S. families are much richer now, at least on paper. The average net worth of households headed by someone 55 to 64 increased by 180,000 from uh, January 2020 to fe September 2021. The average for those uh, between 65 and 74 increased by 194. May I just say something? The averages are smaverages. Who cares? Me and Jeff Bezos, our average uh, net worth is, I don't know, 50 billion bucks. I don't even know what his net worth is. But you can take him with his $100 billion net worth and my with a $100 net worth, and our average net worth is $50 billion. All right, so let's take me, you, and uh, Jeff. All right, you got a million bucks, I got 100 bucks, and Jeff has $100 billion. Our median net worth is something we should look more at, which is uh, be a million bucks, right? So 50% of the people have more, 50% of the people have less. That's a big difference in the average, just as an FYI. So if the top... 10% are increasing by freaking just shoot, like a rocket ship by design and everybody else is staying flat. The averages still go up. All right. So let's keep reading this. So I don't, I don't care about your stupid averages. Um, but then we got some Sharon Oberlander who's an advisor at Merrill Lynch said, people forget the markets go down. Uh, given strong performance of stocks and since the pandemic hit, some early retirees may actually have an exa exaggerated sense of optimism about future returns. Really, Sharon? Did, did you actually study that? Did you look into it? Have you even studied your clients? Do they have a future, uh, an exaggerated sense of optimism about future returns? I guarantee you haven't done it. And I guarantee if you did, you would say they don't have an exaggerated sense of optimism. They actually have a, a more doom and gloom because like this can't last. That's why they're taking the gains to retire because this is to get it out while the getting's good. Only makes sense to me, I guarantee. So who has an exaggerated sense, of op exaggerated sense of optimism about future returns? No one here does, I can tell you that right now. Everybody has a, a negative sense of optimism or an exaggerated sense maybe of pessimism. All right. Uh, let's see. Some advisors suggest dialing back on riskier investments. Yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, I want to read more about my man, Greg Gressel, because uh, – um, oh, well, I did like this, actually. This is my man, Dougie Fresh Wilson. Uh, he retired from a sales job at Johnson Controls. Uh, he felt comfortable because a bull market and a recent 30% rise in real estate pushed his net worth above his retirement goal. Uh, the plan that he and his advisor formulated accounts for a mortgage, four years of college for his youngest, and a health insurance to Cobra. Right? He recently reduced his holdings to 60% from 70% in stocks. Um, in the event of a bear market, he can support his family for about eight years by liquidating his bonds without selling any stocks. That's actually a pretty good move. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. But let's go back to Gressel here. Um, here's another guy. He was making bank as an airline uh, pilot at United, but he's not going to take your mandate at Java. So he said uh, he and his wife downsized. They sold their 2,600-square-foot home in Houston 
uh, for 300000 and moved it to a one-bedroom home in Marathon Florida. So they probably downsized significantly. And they're going to spend a couple thousand less than what they were budgeting for retirement. Good. Um, we got another airline worker, Miss Gonzalez. All right, but I want to find uh, right here. Let's go back to Gressel. Right here. Someone who decided on early retirement did so after losing their job. Uh, Mr. Gressel found himself in that position after being laid off by Hershey. That spring, he invested some of his severance into beaten down tech stocks. And over the summer, uh, while hiking, he checked the value of his portfolio uh, and the balance was just shy of the $2 million he calculated that he and his wife, Beth, would need to retire. I got a huge smile on my face. So Beth quit her job as an admin assistant for a medical center, and the company sold their home in Hershey, PA, for four seventy-four, dollars or about 40% more than what they paid for it in 2012. All right, so let's just do the numbers. So basically they paid 335 335 times 1.4. Yeah, about eh, probably $340, actually. $340 times 1.4. There you go. So they paid $340 is their present value. Their future value is 474. They have, we'll just say 10 years, or maybe nine years is fine. Um, and their so their average rate of return is 3.76. I mean that's 3.76. That's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Crazy. All right. So, but also too they so they quit so they sold their house in Hershey for 474. They purchased a 515 thousand dollar home in Durango with a mortgage below three percent. We were not just a beneficiary of the stock market. We were also a beneficiary of a housing bubble. Did Durango not go up with, with, with them? literally, I don't understand that. So let me just look at something. Here's your typical Hershey PA, three bed, two bath house. Uh, here's one for 469. It's probably similar to what he had. All right, there you go. That's four bed, three baths on a third of an acre. All right. So let's see what we got here. Nothing fancy there. Nice looking house, but nothing fancy. All right. <clears throat> and that was built in 1956. Let's go to now Durango, Colorado. And let's just take a gander. I, I don't know anything about Durango, Colorado. Sounds nice. Um, I don't know the first thing about it. Probably ski town. I mean, <laughs> you know, let's just say this 500,001. Three bed, two bath on a, uh, what's that? About a little bit more than about an eighth of an acre. All right. 1,200 square foot. Yeah, that's a little bit different there, guy. Um, that is like a condo. There's two, yeah, that's uh yeah, I don't, that's weird. So I, I think uh, this guy didn't buy a house for 515000 in Durango. Not anywhere near, let's see, here's 646. Let's see what that one looks like. Three bed, three bath on five acres at least. I bet you'd buy that. Uh, let's just look at 850. There you go. There's five beds, two and a half baths in Durango. Yeah, look at that. No, on a, a quarter acre. Yeah, that something's fishy, but old Greg Gressel here. Um, he sold his house in Hershey for four seventy four. Then they purchased a five hundred fifteen thousand dollar home in Durango, with a mortgage below three percent. So this guy's setting up for failure. You can see that a mile away, and it's going to get. I'm going to show you even more. All right, so here we go. Three bed, two and a half bath. There you go. Maybe he bought that one, something like that. All right, that's uh, on a fifteen hundred square foot lot. Uh, okay. Yes, that that doesn't make any sense. On a 1,500 square foot lot? What the hell is that? 725. There we go. What's this right here? On a 7,000 square foot lot? Built, yeah, something, something's fishy. There's no way he bought a house for 515 in Durango. Um, and he sold his house for 474. And he says, we were not just a beneficiary of the stock market. We were also beneficiary of the housing bubble. The housing bubble affected both sides. In November, he sold his tech stocks for a sizable gain, and currently the Gressels have 10% of their portfolio in stocks, 15% in commodities, 30% in Bitcoin, and the rest in cash. I'm not in Bitcoin for the next year. I'm in it for 10 years, I believe, in the long-term thesis. The thesis. His wife, he and his wife, parents to five grown children, live pretty frugally. I like to hike my like That's not even... Okay, I mean, look, so uh, that's good, man. I, I appreciate he's got a big family. That doesn't make any sense. This whole thing doesn't make sense. I'm probably not as concerned about the long term as I should be. He has seen people die before, soon after retiring, which impacted my idea of how much enough. I completely agree with that, but what I'm just saying is like, they're not working. They got 
30% in Bitcoin, 15% in commodities, 10% in stocks, and the rest in cash. They got a big fat mortgage. They, there's no way they bought a house for 515,000 bucks. I don't understand that. And they got big, he's only, she's 54, and he's what, 56 or something like that? Anyway, so I want to go down to comments here because uh, uh, I want to I see if I can find it. Uh, Jane says, retire early, 1.8 million invested wisely? Sure, retire with almost 2 million with 30,000 invested in Bitcoin and a freaking fat mortgage too, Jane? Ugh, that's kind of scary. More than likely, he bought some Bitcoin a long time ago and became 30% of the portfolio. I, I completely agree with that. Um, that's uh, complete. So it's 30% of his portfolio, um, but he's got a big fat mortgage. Eesh. Um, and then right here, Chase Brooklyn says, it's common for people to fear what they do not know. I, I, I'm so sick of people saying that. Like, oh, you're, you don't like Bitcoin because you're ignorant of it. They just keep saying that. It's, it's nuts, man. Um, I, I just, you don't know it, so you're, you're dumb, essentially dumb. All right, so let's see what we got here because uh, Greg right here. An expert Nobel Prize economist, Paul Krugman, wrote that in 2005, it would be clear that the Internet's effect on the economy is no more than the fax machines. Okay, so Paul Krugman said that. Does that mean that, so kind of like the vax, because the vax supposedly uh, uh, eliminated smallpox, all vax works. <laughs> Stupid. Because Paul Krugman said the internet was not going to be any more than a fax machine, Bitcoin works. It's just dumb. Don't forget Paul Samuelson, another, I think he won a Nobel, I'm sure he did. He's in every single stupid textbook, said in 1989, the Soviet Union was going to decimate the United States because communism was a better economy than the U.S. was. Stupid. But check this out. It would be irresponsible to invest in Bitcoin without fully understanding not only the technology behind it, but also the game theory and macroeconomics. It took over 100 hours before I started buying BTC. A thousand hours later, I fully believe in the long-term proposition. It's a thesis. It's just a thesis. But also understanding the game theory and the it's just it's like he do whatever he wants. I don't care. Um, but that's freaking risky. These other guys know. Uh, the guy who said I got eight years I can live on my bonds. That's not risky. And Greg's risky. I, I don't get. I, look, do whatever you want to do. I don't care. But both those guys got a mortgage. That's they're going to be their downfall right there. Retirement is not risky if you go into it no debt. I just got off the phone with these people today, man. They've been in freaking. You know, cash lake portfolio for a long time not all cash but a, a significant proportion the issue is they're between them they're gonna make a hundred thousand a year in social security they got no debt whatsoever they don't spend that much but it's not like they're living frugally we still got them budget 10 to fifteen thousand a year vacation goals yeah, they're just healthy they're staying alive staying alive they just like to freaking have fun in the mid-60s they don't smoke you know they might drink every now and again but there are no medications but they don't have any debt, none. And they just, you know, it's not like they're, I mean, they're spending 100,000 a year. Small pensions, 14,000 between them, between them pension. But it's between their social security and their pension, that's gonna cover all their income needs. And they're spending six, you know, six figures. And because social security is the bulk of their income, hardly any taxes. Tough, tough place to be. I mean, it's a great place to be. It's tough, tough to make that uh, proposition that they're risky. It's crazy. Yeah, love your thoughts. We'll see you.